future of MOOCs in the world. And in 2000, yeah, please. Okay. Uh, and uh, I, would like, I want to read his bio. Of course, uh, his CV is more than that. Just I have picked some points describing him. Professor Stefan Downs works with the Digital Technology Research Center at the National Research Council of Canada, specializing in new instructional media and personal learning technology. His degrees are in philosophy, interesting, uh, philosophy of mind and philosophy of science. He has taught for several universities like the University of Alberta and Athabasca University, that, which are the pioneers of technology enhanced learning, in, you can say that. And he's one of the originators of the first massive open online course or MOOC. Uh, he has published frequently about online and network learning and his great ideas help in forming the future of e-learning. Uh, he's one of the initiatives of this era, the era, era of e-learning and technology enhanced learning. He has published hundreds of articles and has presented around the world to academic conferences in dozens of the countries, and now we can say, including Iran. Thank you, Professor Downs, for accepting our invitation. It's our, uh, our honor to have you here among us. Uh, the stage is yours. Please go on. Thank you very much. It is a genuine pleasure to be able to speak to all of you in Iran. Um, and to share my thoughts about the next generation of MOOCs today. So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's a sincere pleasure to be here. I'm just going to share my slides. If I can find the little command that allows me to do that. There we go. Uh, excellent. And now you should be seeing my slides with my cat, Julia, looking out on my backyard. This is a couple of days ago, and this is what it looks like in Canada right now, where I am uh, sending my message from. So I'm going to talk about the next generation of MOOCs. And uh, of course, MOOC stands for Massive Open Online Course. And I'm sure you're all familiar with th that term massive there may be as many as a hundred thousand people in a course or as few as a, a few dozen uh, open it means it's open to anyone around the world online means of course it's online and course means it has a starting point and an ending point uh, you mentioned the original MOOC uh, this was what we call a CMOOC. It's based on the idea of free access and open educational resources. So there were no costs to people to participate in the MOOC. And we invited as many people as wanted to join around the world. And we got about 2,200 people in our MOOC. And the idea of setting it up as this distributed sort of network that you can see pictured here is that we were able to reach thousands of instructions. So there were no bottlenecks. There were no points where we had to do some sort of thing for each one of the 2,200 people. The C in CMOOC stands for connectivist. And this is the idea that knowledge is distributed across a network of connections and therefore that learning consists in the ability to construct those networks and to move around those networks. Connectivism instantiates in different forms. In the human brain, connectivism is the connection between neurons. Our knowledge that we have in our head literally is the connections between individual neurons. In a society, connectivism, connection, is the connection between people. And so a society can have knowledge by forming connections and allowing interactions between people. And so that was the theory that we based our original MOOC on, and that was 
the motivation for the design of that MOOC. The elements of the MOOC, and here I borrow from a nice diagram by Isa Reze, uh, included not just the presentation of the content, but also the elements of interaction. So there was network empowerment, recombination, analysis, accreditation, the design of the network, targeting toward people who were interested in a common topic, uh, knowledge facilitation. I, as an instructor in the MOOC, was not just presenting content was not just a coach or a guide, but I was a participant in the MOOC, sort of like an equal among equals, perhaps with a little more knowledge. And then, of course, the whole idea of feedback and evaluation. We resonated together in this environment. After we created the MOOC, a second form of MOOC, the X MOOC, came about. It stands for, the X in X MOOC stands for extended. And this is a much more traditional model of the MOOC. Uh, it, it looks like a traditional course, week one, week two, week three, where you present activities, instruction, and so on. Uh, the X MOOC, was innovative in its own right. Um, and the people who developed the first X MOOCs, people like uh, Norvig and Thrun with their uh, artificial intelligence MOOC in 2011, they used cloud content and video storage so that they could expand the provision of resources to as many people as possible um, so they could use the same resource to teach 10 people or 150,000 people simply by balancing the load and then using automated technology like automated grading. Early MOOCs, however, faced pedagogical challenges. And the big pedagogical challenge uh, was completion. There were several studies, including a famous study out of Penn State, that showed that the number of people participating in a MOOC dropped dramatically. Um, and you can see from this diagram here, we start out with 100. After week one, we're down to 50 people. And after week four, we're down to about 35 people. And this is very typical, uh, especially of X MOOCs, less so of C MOOCs. And there were studies done to try to figure out how to fix this, but putting in interventions in front of the MOOC did not improve completion rates. So they tried to use plans, they tried to show the value of the MOOC, they tried to introduce social accountability. These various mechanisms failed. You can't simply tell people or try to motivate them to finish, it really has to do with the design of the MOOC itself. And, and in my opinion, the interactivity, the participatory nature of the MOOC. Anyhow, as time went by, other MOOCs exploring various aspects of this continued to develop. We offered more C MOOCs. The X MOOC people offered more X MOOCs and companies like Coursera and edX were developed. Jim Groom developed what he did not call a MOOC, but I consider it one, based on doing tasks. That was the DS106, or Digital Storytelling MOOC. And time went by, and then we had the pandemic. And with the pandemic, there was the surge of interest in online learning and people began to catch up with the MOOC and to try to think about how to bring in this sense of community and sense of interaction that we see in the classroom into the online environment. Well, how do we do that? As it turns out, over the two, two and a half years of the pandemic, people providing MOOCs began to learn more 
from the experience of people in distance education. And here I think of people like Tony Bates and Terry Anderson, Diana Laurelard, and many others who think about the design of learning as well as the design of books or resources online. One example, and this one is uh, used by uh, Motion Kasavars and uh, Andrea Gunham in the Armand MOOC website, uh, draws from Tony Bates's sections model. And here's the model. Uh, and it basically involves considering each of students' ease of use, cost, teaching functions, interaction, organization, network, and security. And to provide a MOOC, you need to take into account each of these eight different factors. And it could be argued that one of the reasons there were issues with retention in X MOOCs is that they did not pay sufficient attention to these, especially the pedagogical function, the interaction, and the networking. So we began to see new models develop. Uh, as the pandemic came along to enable what we might call this next generation of MOOCs. What happened first was the role of the MOOC began to change a bit. It, it started originally as an open online course, but it, it expanded. So we could see a MOOC as a replacement for a traditional course, or we could see a MOOC as a service that we just offer to the public and they can access it when and how they want. And that very much characterizes my own MOOCs. Or we could see it as a driver, perhaps, for example, as a way of encouraging people to continue their studies and perhaps enroll in a more traditional higher education course. Or we might see it as an added value, something that we have over and above existing traditional courses, you know, sort of like a textbook, sort of like a resource, sort of like a community where people studying in a more familiar environment can go online, meet with each other, and expand their experience of the subject and the domain. We also saw um, in the years leading to the pandemic, the evolution of what are called open educational practices. And, and here people like um, uh, Helen Beetham and Alison Littlejohn are important. Open educational practices is the next evolution of thinking about open educational resources. And it's the idea that we move beyond simply providing free and open learning resources to people. And we begin thinking about the sort of design and the sort of pedagogy that supports open education. And there's a, a common taxonomy that people have been using to talk about and consider open educational practices. And these include open assessment, open collaboration, the open educational resources themselves, and open teaching. And when you think about it, and, and this is something that George Siemens and I used to talk about as well, we, we can actually run down the line and think about all of the different practices in education as open practices. In my own work, uh, working as a researcher, I work a lot with open science and open data um, and open work where people actually see the work that I do and the mistakes that I make um, in real time as I make them. Even open thinking so people can see how I work through a problem. So open educational practices now begin to be applied to our thinking about massive open online courses. So what does that mean? Well, one example is collaborative online document authoring. And this 
kind of draws from the work that Jim Groom did, and it kind of draws from the technology that enables this kind of practice. Uh, here in Canada, for example, we use Google Docs, uh, although there are other services. I think Etherpad is a service that supports this, uh, where multiple people get together in a single document and they all write the document at the same time. And we find that there are various stages to document authoring, collaborative document authoring, and there are various roles, a writer, a consultant, a reviewer. Last summer, I took part in a collaborative authoring of a document about uh, fair open data, that is, data that is findable, accessible, interactive, and reusable. So we all got together and created this document collectively. Another aspect is decentralized course design. Uh, with, the C, with the X MOOCs especially, we had this idea of there being one course that everybody would take. But we find that different versions of the course are more appropriate to different departments. So traditionally, the way we would do this is we would have math for engineers, for example, math for physicians, math for artists even, or math for business. And that's how we would do it. The problem is now we have four separate courses, four silos. Now we have the centralized courses like the X MOOCs, which just create one math course for everybody, but one math course doesn't really work for everybody. The needs of somebody in arts are very different from the needs of somebody in business. So today we're looking at decentralized course design where all of these different versions of the math course are interlinked. So it's a decentralized course but they're still interacting together. So math faculty and arts faculty and medical faculty can all talk together within this context of the course designed for each of these individuals. This sort of approach to course design is enabled by a technology that we call federation. Now what a federation is, and I could do a whole talk on this, a federation is a principle in social networks where instead of having one single central service like Twitter or Facebook or Google, you have distinct individual services that are connected together. I sometimes call it the community of communities. So uh, a software that makes this possible is called Mastodon, which is what I use, and the technology behind it is called ActivityPub. And it's sort of like multiple instances of Twitter, but all communicating with each other. What's nice about federation is you can use different technologies for different things that connect together with each other. So right now in the world, there is something called the Fediverse. So you can have Mastodon instances or a different software called Friendica or a different software called New Social. And in the world of education, we could sort of imagine this as, you know, one MOOC service, a different MOOC service, a different MOOC service, you know, Coursera, edX, Grasshopper, but all communicating with each other using this communications technology. In the broader sense, we call this Web3. Now, Web3 is something that's just beginning to develop now. It's very interesting, but it's also very early days. Um, a lot of people represent Web3 as simply being you know, the blockchain for web, and it does use some blockchain technologies. But it also brings together data and artificial intelligence to create this kind of federation that I've been talking about. 
blockchain, for example, is used to create persistent objects or persistent identity in a federation. So we're getting new distributed platforms. And as, as Doug Belshaw says, these enable an art architecture of participation based on co-creating and sharing resources. So each of us has our own platform and our own community, but we have an architecture where as we wish, we're not required, but as we wish, we can interact, cooperate, and share resources with other people. Much like the worldwide conference system, and here we are, I'm in Canada, you are in Iran, and we have our different systems, we have our different communities, but we're still able to share and interact with each other, and it helps both of us grow and develop. We might call this Ed3. Uh, I called it eLearning 3.0 in a MOOC I did a few years ago. And you can view that entire MOOC online at el3o.mooc.ca. And it talks about the various elements of Web3 technology that come together to build these federated communities. So what does that look like? It looks like an architecture for supporting open educational resources. It involves content, it involves community and networks, it involves, ma it involves management and infrastructure, even review, moderation, practices and pedagogies. All these come together to create these new types of MOOCs. What types of MOOCs? Well, for example, the data-based MOOC, or DB MOOC, which is built around a cooperative database. So instead of collaboratively authoring a document, we collaboratively author a database. Or the live linked data MOOC, or LD MOOC, where we're still working with data, but now we're working with live data from around the world. A good example of this is a MOOC in medical entomology from France that traces using real-time data the emergence of uh, chicken, <laughs> chikungunya, which is a disease around the world. It's a type of dengue fever. We also are able to bring in artificial intelligence to support these MOOCs. There are many applications, and again, that's a whole other talk, about artificial intelligence in education. Everything from diagnosing learner progress, predicting outcomes, uh, creating new content, or evaluating uh, essays, text, and other submissions. An example that brings all of these together is a MOOC offered recently by FutureLearn for Earth Monitoring for Climate Science. And it brings together real-time data from around the world and then applies artificial intelligence to it. And so students in that course are working with these tools in order to do things like make climate predictions. Finally, we have massive open online simulations, or MOOs, and that's where we create the MOOC in the multiverse. So we see some examples here. I've been experimenting recently, for example, with Mozilla Hubs, which is a three-dimensional virtual environment where we can bring in all of these other elements of a MOOC. The multiverse includes virtual reality, it includes augmented reality, and it combines it with the kind of Web3 technologies that I talked about to create persistent digital objects such as identifications or documents that we author collaboratively. So that's my time. 
that's the presentation that I have, and I thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you today, and I'd be happy to address any questions that you may have. Many thanks, uh, Stefan, for your fantastic, fruitful uh, presentation. The way you depicted the future of MOOCs for us was really amazing. And besides that, I do appreciate your attention to Iran's national MOOCs platform, Arman. Uh, as the head of developers of this platform and on behalf of my colleagues, uh, here, I should thank you for your kind support, direct and di indirect support in developing this platform. By indirect, I mean that Professor Downs is so generous for distributing his knowledge and expertise. Uh, I, I, I suppose that it's more than 10 years that I am a remote student of him. <laughs> and by direct support, I mean that he he's so kind that he answered every individual questions that I had, and he supported the team, the Iranian team, for developing Arman. Thank you, Professor Downs, and thank you for your attention in your presentation to Iranian lit literature. A slide from Dr. Rezai work in Persian. The picture was in Persian. Thank you very much. If there is any question here from the audience, you can come here or you can ask it in Persian. We will translate it to English for uh, Professor Downs. Please. Hello, Professor Downs. Uh, thank you for, for your presentation. I had a question regarding the notion of the federations and, uh, you know, mm, for example, con uh, considering uh, different MOOCs are connected together and can uh, share uh, resources with each other. How is this not uh, mm, somehow, look, for example, uh, we have a, com uh, a network, uh, for example, a network of computers uh, in this building and uh, we have a network in uh, the other and they're connected to each other through the internet. So basically, these uh, networks uh, don't have an individual identity of some sort, and the whole uh, internet uh, endeavor uh, mm, devours these uh, single networks. So in this sense, uh, the internet is basically uh, the whole uh, uh, connection system. And uh, I don't understand how is this different than uh, what we currently have? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I will say the basic design of the internet is a federation. Um, we have individual computer networks in individual institutions. They are their own networks and yet they are still connected. So the internet itself is a federation. So what makes this different is that instead of connecting, well, in addition to connecting uh, computer networks at the hardware and the transfer protocol levels, we're now doing this at the application level. Uh, previously, applications were centered on a single node or a single server like Facebook, like Twitter. So no matter where you are in the world, you're connecting to this single node in order to participate in this network. Now applications themselves are distributed across the multiple nodes. So just as we have different hardware instances, now we have different application instances. And then the second part is just like we have the transit protocols like HTTP or FTP to connect the individual networks, now we have protocols to connect applications. This has been an evolving science. People try to do it with things like web services and representational state transfers. Now we're looking at things like ActivityPub 
in order to connect these together. Activity Pub is a worldwide uh, web consortium uh, protocol that they've put forward. And so it's a way for services or applications to connect with each other to create this distributed uh, application of multiple instances. Does that answer your question? Uh, if I have understood right, it's, uh, it's for example, uh, in the Twitter example, if uh, we have uh, break down the application code and put it in different servers in different locations, and now these uh, single parts uh, work together to perform the whole function. And right. we can uh, have such notion for different applications together. Exactly, that's exactly right. Thank you very much. Thank you. If there is another question. Any other question? No? Uh, Professor Downs, may I ask a question yes. myself? What, what is your idea about developing regional MOOCs in local languages like the ones in French, in Persian, in Turkey, Arabic, and so on? Sure. Um, and just before I answer this, I'll point out there are also some questions in the chat. I see them. <laughs> Um, okay. and, and I'll respond to them in the chat after uh, I finish talking. With respect to the question that you just asked, um, this is important. Uh, and this is one of the things that I've tried to involve myself in over the years. The development of MOOCs in different languages and based in different communities. Uh, the French community will, will know of the work that I did in uh, actually hosting a MOOC in French on Open Educational Resources, or in French, uh, Resources Educatives Libre, uh, as well. I've worked a lot with the Spanish-speaking community. Uh, I've worked with the Arab League, Alexo, uh, in helping with their program. And I've also, as, as you pointed out, uh, worked with people in Iran not directly, obviously, but indirectly to do what I could from here to support Iranian um, uh, uh, MOOCs. And the reason why this is important is that uh, instead of a single culture uh, defining and dominating the entire space of the internet the way it does in a centralized social network. Individual cultural MOOCs in individual language allows each community around the world to add their own distinctive perspective to the global conversation. And it's my opinion, based on you know, the work that I've done in connectivism, that it is better from a global perspective to have a diversity of voices, a diversity of languages, and a diversity of cultures. Because this gives us different ways of looking at the same thing, different ways of talking about the same thing, different ways of seeing the world. And it's by having these different ways of seeing the world that we can learn and that we can grow together. So I very much support the creation of uh, you know, MOOCs in many languages from many cultures. Uh, thank you very much. And I don't have the chat box here. Uh, if uh, there is any question in the chat box uh, and you prefer to answer it, you can, I suppose. We have the questions in the chat box here. Uh, shall I read them? Yes, I, I would rather that uh, Stefan choose the questions himself. Maybe he prefers to answer some because he said just there are some questions. Okay. If, uh, is there any question in the chat box that you prefer to answer it? Well, I, I can do a few fairly quickly here. Um, so uh, we have one person saying uh, blockchain can be used to share educational and scientific tips in a transparent and non-manipulatable way. That's an excellent point. And that's 
you know, everybody talks about digital currencies when they talk about blockchain. And to me, that's almost irrelevant. What is important about blockchain technologies is precisely that, that what is presented in a blockchain, what is shared in a blockchain is not manipulable. Uh, once it's there, it's there, and the message can't be changed as it passed from person to person. And that's really important. That's where you get the idea of persistence from in blockchain. Um, another person, Layla, is saying, uh, it seems that new MOOCs is a kind of you learning platform. By you, I think university is what you meant. I'm hoping so, because that's what I'm going to answer. And I would say yes. Um, and it's the sort of thing that is gradually developing. In the world of traditional learning technology, the learning management system, which was intended to present a course, this is evolving into what we now call a learning experience platform. And the difference between an LMS and a learning experience platform is the platform connects to other applications or other services. So the learning experience platform is sort of beginning to do its own kind of federation. And over time, the learning experience platform and the new kinds of MOOCs gradually move closer together and converge. I think that is probably what's going to happen. Uh, let's see. Uh, how do you predict the future of MOOCs? Asks Ruella. I think that's basically how I predict it. That MOOCs and learning management systems sort of gradually form this web and it becomes a more and more dense web of more and more specific services and applications that are linked together using technology such as, well, ActivityPub is one. Another technology is XAPI for Activity Records. Uh, another technology is IMS's learning tools, interoperability, etc. These individual technologies are what create the link between application and application. Uh, that's all I see right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, maybe a few minutes, maybe about two, if there is any question from the audience in the hall. Thank you very much, uh, dear Stefan, for your fantastic presentation and accepting the invitation of this Congress. Uh, hope to meet you again in uh, the other events. Thank you very much. Have a nice day ahead. Thank you, thank and you. thank you for the invitation.